Excellent. Well, welcome again to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is the third in the series of Connecticut in Industry and Innovation. Today, we're going to talk about the Electric Boat Company out of Groton. And please give a warm welcome to Mr. Art Gottlieb. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so we're ready to go? Good. Um, well, I'm actually going to use two slideshows for you today. Uh, because we have an hour and a half uh, on these programs. It's a little more time than uh, we, I usually give to these programs, so I can actually spread it out a little bit. I want to talk to you about submarines and give you an idea of um, the history of submarines and what makes a submarine work, uh, which I hope will uh, offer an insight about how complex they are to actually build. And uh, we'll do that in the context of electric boat. The first slideshow I've got for you is on probably the most famous boat um, that was constructed by Electric Boat Company here in Connecticut. And as you probably already know, that's the Nautilus. Can you see that? No. Not yet. Okay, so I need to go to screen share first, and then you'll be able to see it. Now you can see it. Yeah, yes. Great. So uh, anybody here um, besides me been on the submarine? Yeah, it's not for everybody. You know, I I'm really good with small typed spaces, right? If you need somebody to crawl in the tight space or not freak out for not seeing sunlight for a week and a half, uh, I'm your guy. Uh, not that I'm looking to do that at the moment, but this is a picture of the beautiful shot of the uh, USS Nautilus. And uh, that is, uh, if you didn't know this, a, uh, the first uh, atomic ship uh, and certainly significant in that regard alone, but it's also first the first atomic submarine, which means that it doesn't have to surface. Uh, it has a power plant that will enable it to run underwater. And it doesn't use up any oxygen and it doesn't emit any exhaust gases. So therefore it, you can stay underwater for the endurance of the crew, you know, until you run out of food or people start going, you know, crazy you know, uh, or they have different mechanisms that will actually scrub the air before any of those other two things will happen. And this was a complete game changer. And this, this, the ship was awarded to the construction of it to the electric boat company. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there are only two companies in the United States um, for a very long time to have the capacity to build a submarine for the United States Navy. And uh, all of the submarines we have today are nuclear submarines. We have no conventionally powered submarines. And those two locations are at uh, Groton, Connecticut, at the Electric Boat Company, and they are at Newport News, Virginia, uh, off the Chesapeake. And that's it. And both of them are, of course, are have been hard targets throughout the entire Cold War. Right. So no, the hard target means that should um, somebody who wishes to do us harm uh, launch a nuclear missile somewhere, this was one of the places they would probably do it. OK, you knock out our sub bases. It means that we have no ability to repair a nuclear submarine, let alone build one. Uh, the Nautilus, of course, was named after Jules Verne's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, you know, uh, fictional submarine uh, shown here in this, in this artist's rendering of what the Nautilus looked like. And this is not the actual Nautilus. This is inside the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Jules, Verge, Ver, uh, uh, Jules Verne's version of the Nautilus, you know, and inside you have this, um, you know, 19th century version of what some kind of a modern machine would look like, you know. 
I don't know what these things on the wall, they, they look like boar's heads, kind of like with spigots, you know, it, it makes me want to put like a beer stein under there and get some beer, you know. So this is the first submarine that was actually envisioned. Um, you know, submarines are something that is used against the larger force. You know, it, it's like a force multiplier submarine because you're using stealth as your primary weapon, you see? I mean, that's the essence of the submarine is stealth. You're underwater, you see? Now, this is um, David Bushnell's The Turtle. And The Turtle was envisioned and designed uh, even though it never went into operational service it, during the American Revolutionary War. So, right, so you've got this large Ameri uh, British blockading fleet. And what better way for a nation like ours that wasn't a nation yet to go and sink one of His Majesty's warships than when some kind of a gadget like this, you see? So in other words, you, you sort of sneak out there into the harbor and you put this thing on the back of it, which is a mine, right? You screw it onto the bottom of his majesty's ship because after all, they're made out of wood. And then you basically get yourself out of there, right? It's the trick with explosives. You can always get explosives to explode. The, the trick is not to be there when they explode, right? So this is, has all of the things that you actually need in a submarine. You know, you've got a method of forward propulsion, right? You've kind of got a, a mechanism to go up and down, you see? Um, and you have to have pumps that'll actually let water in to a couple of tanks to make the craft heavier to sink down. And then you actually pump the water out to actually make the craft lighter to rise. You know, it's not as easy as it sounds, you know, I mean, you wind up, if you pop through the surface, which is called broaching, then you got a problem because then the sailors on, on the aforementioned His Majesty's ship will then start shooting at you. And you can, and there's no air in there, of course, you just have the ambient air that you started with before you close the hatch. You see, this is the old days before, it's, if this was today, they would be dressed differently. You see, now this guy's in this, and he's got his, he's got a jacket on, the dude's wearing a bow tie. You see him? If that was me, I'd probably be wearing sweatpants, I have to admit, maybe a t-shirt, you know? So here is actually a picture, well, actually it's a, a sketch of the first submarine that accomplished something. And it was, and it was a submarine that was in the same political situation as Mr. Bushnell was there. You've got a small, almost non-existent Navy and you're facing a large Navy and you wanna use the submarine as a force equalizer. And the situation here is that this is a Confederate Navy submarine, right? The American Union Navy had blockaded all of the Southern ports right, and as an economic and military blockade. And so now the United States Union forces, right, were in the same position that the Royal Navy was. And now the underdog was the Confederate State Navy. And they down, were down in Charleston, were gonna go out and they were going to attach a mine to one of the United States ships and essentially sink it, you see. And this spar on the right side of the photograph has something called a torpedo at the end, right? And uh, that's actually what a torpedo is. We, we have different terminology of it today, but, and the idea is that you're going to attach that torpedo and then you're gonna back off. And that torpedo is gonna to be stuck into the side of one of those ships that were still made out of wood. And then you get out of there. Now, this is a horrible little craft. It's called the US, it's called the CSS for Confederate State Ships, Hunley, H-U-N-E-L-Y. And uh, it has, you see these eight guys in there sitting there with a crank? That's a crank. So you get eight guys and you sit in there, there's no air, 
you're perspiring like crazy and you're just cranking this thing for propulsion. Um, so these guys went out the first time and they get hit by a wave and the water goes in through the top and all nine of these fellows drown. And it was not far enough away from the beach where it was unrecoverable. So they just went out with a, a tackle of horses and, and, and some ropes and they pulled it back ashore. And then they took the nine guys out and they buried them. And then they uh, drained the vessel and they got another nine volunteers. Right. And they went out essentially the same exact thing happened. Right. The next nine guys just drowned. Um, and then they had to find nine more volunteers. Right. How would you have liked to have been a volunteer for that third time around? Right. Oh, sure. I'll go. You know, but. The third time around was a charm because they actually made it out to a ship, uh, a union blockading ship, and they attached the spar torpedo. And they backed off and it succeeded in actually exploding the ship. And uh, then the ship took a wave and the Hunley sank, killing all nine people. But it was successful in it being the first submarine in the history of the world to sink a ship with a torpedo. And um, the Union Navy lost the ship, sunk by a torpedo. And um, that ship, by the way, it's a little bit of Connecticut history, if you want. It's called the USS Housatonic, okay, as in the Housatonic River. So that was the first ship sunk by a submarine. And it was during the American Civil War. So by the turn of the century, um, the 19th into the 20th century, you have now actually a practical submarine. Uh, even though it was, of course, by today's standards, like, you know, uh, prehistoric. And um, you have this thing here called the USS Holland. And the USS Holland was manufactured by the Holland Boat Company. And that was out in New Jersey. And um, what makes this boat significant was it was the first United States submarine that we actually as a country bought from Mr. Holland. And the electric boat company was actually started to manufacture Holland designed boats specifically. And uh, so they started, they, they moved their production facility from New Jersey over of course to the current location of electric boat company on the Thames River. And uh, this is the, our first United States submarine, the USS Holland. Now, an interesting point also was Mr. Holland, he designed the submarine because he was an Irishman, an Irish American now, right? He had adopted the United States as his, as his nation, but he was pretty angry at the British as a lot of people were back in those days, if you were Irish. And he wanted to create, he wanted to actually use these and create like an Irish Navy to go after the British Navy uh, because the British had this huge fleet, you know, before World War I. And um, that didn't happen. So he had such a good design that the different companies, countries started buying it, including us. Behind that little um, shield on the front is actually one torpedo. And so this is the design that started Electric Boat Company. And it's USS Holland and it's SS-1, the first American Navy submarine to be commissioned, right? And then the designs, they advanced through these different letter categories and they became a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And they were miserable little craft back in the early days. You know, they used paraffin engines. They weren't properly ventilated. If you went, if you dove, you weren't sure if you were going to come up half the time. You know, and they tested these things right out in the Long Island Sound, right? Right in Long Island Sound out into Block Island Sound. You know, so if you're a boater and you're out there, it wouldn't be an unusual thing to have seen a submarine or two. <clears throat> And this is the first real um, practical warship that was a submarine of an American design. This is called an S-boat. 
And we still had these things in, they were manufactured in the 1920s and the 1930s. And we still had a few of these things around serving World War II, okay? I can tell you a whole story about, I could talk about submarines for a long time. And um, S-boats were, they were riveted together. They weren't welded together. They had a lot of leaks and they were pretty old by the time World War II started. And the thing is with the S-boats is that they still use the old torpedoes that were designed in World War I. So ironically, when World War II started, the brand new submarines that we had, which were much superior as submarines to an S boat, the new submarines called fleet boats couldn't sink anything because they used this new special torpedo called a Mark 14, which did not work. So, um, so these new modern submarines, once the Pacific War started in 1942, right after Pearl Harbor. You would sail 3,000 miles to Japan, insert yourself in the middle of a Japanese convoy, and these fleet boats were sending torpedoes into Japanese ships, and they just wouldn't sink anything because the torpedoes didn't work. They were defective on a number of levels. And, but the old-fashioned S-boats, these cranky old boats that were leaking all over the place, if you put a torpedo into something, it would always explode. It was a, kind of an ironic situation. Uh, here is uh, the largest submarines we ever built back in those days. This is called, this is another boat called the, the Nautilus, by the way. It was huge. They were experimenting, trying to figure out how much was too big, what was too small, you know, and what was just the right size. And this is the design that was standardized in World War II for us, right? This is a Gato type fleet boat. And um, it was a, a remarkable ship. Um, by the way, submarines are usually referred to as boats as a matter of tradition, even to this day, uh, because they started off as a small craft. And so the people call them boats. And it's sort of like an affectionate sort of tradition if they're still referred to as boats, even though they're in every way a ship, um, in case you weren't ever wondering about that. And um, this is what the standardized design was. Uh, there were two different designs of the same basic boat. And that was the electric boat design. And that was the, um, the design that was called the government design. See, but back in World War II, the United States government was running two yards themselves. There were one at Portsmouth Navy Yard in New Hampshire and one at Mare Island in California, okay? So they were manufacturing what were called government fleet boats and the electric boat company was manufacturing electric boat fleet boats, right? And unless you know the differences, they are identical. Let me know if you ever wanna know the differences, I'll be happy to tell you, but I'm trying not to, I'm not trying to make you snooze off too soon here. <laughs> You know, one of the things in propulsion was you needed to have a way to be able to keep your engines running to be able to charge the batteries because the submarines ran on diesel engines that charged batteries. And it was the batteries that were re able to be used underwater, you see, because you can't run the diesel engines when you're underwater. At the end of World War II, 1944 into 1945, the Germans had installed on their submarines this thing called the snorkel, or the schnorkel, if you will, right? Snorkel is anglicized. And what it is, it's like if you ever went swimming with a, with a snorkel, I mean, that's just what it's like. It's got a ball on it. So the Germans became so desperate to get their submarines from being sunk that they actually installed this device it was like a mast and you would actually run the diesel engines underneath the water uh, which means that you could literally stay down there uh, with only the mast sticking out of the water and then the exhaust would come out of the outlet and right next to the outlet would be an intake 
you see. So the water, the, the air would come in the boat and the exhaust would go out through this device. And they had this, um, this ball on the side, so it, which floated, if it got hit by a wave, the ball would stop. And it was just a miserable device because what happened with the ball went up and, and kept the water uh, from going into the intake tube, the engines in the submarine would still be running, but now it was being sucked out of the air inside the submarine instead of the ambient air, which would immediately cause a drop in air pressure inside the boat. And you had these 19, 20 year old young sailors in perfect health, and it was like bursting their eardrums. I mean, it was a really miserable affair. You didn't have a true submersible until you had, until you were independent of the need to have an air breathing engine, you see, and that was nuclear power. And this is 1945 when the allies are bombing these new generation boats that the Germans had, you see it? These are called type 21 U-boats. And they would have been very, very effective craft because they had twice the battery capacity as any submarine. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why it was so important to defeat the Germans as rapidly as possible was because they were technologically advanced. And had they actually, for instance, put a, a fleet of Type 21 U boats, undersea boats, they would have changed the entire submarine war because we didn't have anything that would catch a submarine like this, you see? Now, at the end of World War II, both the Russians and the Americans tried to grab as many of these things as possible because we use them as the basis of all of the post-war submarine construction, right? The Germans had a lot of innovations in these boats and the Russians had a Navy after World War II. And it was a submarine navy, you see? And these were the type of boats that they copied. So it was very important what the Germans were doing. And that's one of those boats. So what we did here in the United States is we sent all of our submarines back to places like Electric Boat Company. And we had them retrofitted to incorporate some of the things that made the German boats have this high level endurance underwater, right? We would, uh, we would upgrade our submarines and call them guppies, right? And everything in the military is an acronym. So guppies stood for greater underwater <clears throat> propulsion, okay? And here is a person who was instrumental in the American post-war nuclear energy uh, project. He was not only in charge of the United States Navy nuclear project, he was also in charge of the Atomic Energy Commission for all civilian nu nuclear projects, right? So we're talking about all of the earlier reactors that controlled electrical generation uh, in the United States, as well as the first reactor that went into a ship, which of course was the USS Nautilus, was all controlled and under the supervision of this one Admiral Rickover, right? And uh, which people hated his guts, by the way. Uh, Rick, Rickover was not a well-liked person. Um, I have a lot of respect for him, but nobody liked him. Um, and I could do a whole story on him someday. It's really due to Admiral Rickover that the United States has never had an operational nuclear accident in a submarine. And that's a lot to say. And there's the Nautilus having been launched into the Thames River at Electric Boat Company, commissioned in 1954. And this was a complete game changer during the Cold War, of course because we now were able to do things like go under the polar ice cap, you see, which you can never do before with a conventional submarine. Uh, now that you've got a ship that can actually stay underwater as long as the Nautilus could and not have to come up, you could actually go from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean 
over the top of the earth, which had never done been done before. And there is, um, that's New London in the background on the other side of the Thames River, right? And here is one of those modernized World War II boats that was built at Electric Boat Company in the river itself. And these are the keel plates being welded together. And I don't know if you know this, but those the, the original keel of the Nautilus is being signed by Harry Truman, okay? Now, despite their different shapes that modern submarines have and the fact that they're missile carrying submarines and not primarily torpedo submarines, um, a nuclear submarine runs on the principle like a nuclear power plant does. It, you have a reactor which generates heat. That's the purpose of the reactor is to generate heat in a controlled fashion. So you create heat by the reactor, right? Now, if you control the reaction of the nuclear um, pile, if you will, then that means you can create just the right amount of heat. And with that right amount of heat, you'll pass cold water through it. And the cold water will be transferred into hot water in the form of boiling water. And as you're aware, boiling water creates steam. And then you take the steam and you actually use that steam to drive turbines. And then those turbines go through reduction gears and the reduction gears drive in the case of the Nautilus, two propellers. And any nuclear system runs like this. If you have a nuclear power plant, you're, instead of driving a propeller, you're driving a generator, you see? And that is what creates energy, you see? That goes onto the power grid. The only difference between the, uh, the Nautilus is that they created a nuclear power plant that would fit inside the hull of the submarine, you see? Any nuclear power plant operates the same way. You have the reactor, you pass water through the reactor, not through the reactor as if the water is going through the reactor. It actually goes in proximity to the reactor where it can actually thermally transfer the heat. And then therefore it remains a sealed system where the, the water is uncontaminated by, by, um, by any kind of nuclear byproducts, you see. And um, and then it creates steam. The steam goes to a series of turbines and then it turns something, some kind of an axle. And the question is, what usable work are you doing with that turning axle, you see? Um, are you driving a propeller or are you driving a big generator to create electricity to put on the power grid, right? And, and, and this is the most modern version of a turning axle. In the old days, I mean, if you built a, uh, if you built a mill on the side of a running river or stream, it would turn a paddle wheel, the running water would turn a paddle wheel. And once again, you would have an axle or a shaft that would be spinning. And the question is, what work are you doing with that spinning shaft? See, so a lot of this is, the only thing you've changed here is the method of creating heat. You know, if we were gonna talk about energy sources, um, if you had a coal powered plant, the coal would be used to make the heat. And then the heat would similarly be used to create steam by boiling water. Or if you have natural gas, the natural gas would be running a furnace and the furnace would be used to create enough heat to boil the water, you see. Uh, the rest of it is all the exact same system. That is Mamie Eisenhower breaking a bottle over the bow of the Nautilus. You know that champagne, you ever see a ship being commissioned? I have. You know, they use a special bottle that is actually has these score marks in it to make sure the damn thing breaks. Did you know that? 
I think that kind of counts as cheating, but I don't remember being consulted on this, okay? The thing is, is that if that bottle of champagne doesn't break on the bow of the ship that, ship that you swing it on, that is considered big time bad luck, big time bad luck. If that puppy bounces off the bow, the, the, the bow of the ship, you're doomed. Or so the superstition goes. And there is the Nautilus in the Thames River. In London is the Thames. In Connecticut is the Thames. All right, go figure. You see the electric boat pennant from, from the sail? See it, EB? There she is headed out into the Long Island Sound. It's a pretty big deal, this whole thing with the Nautilus, you know. It's here, they, they sent this simple message. It became uh, the most important message in, in maritime history, underway on nuclear power. That's it. So for the first time in history, the maritime world, be it the military maritime world or the merchant maritime world or the world of explorers has now finally been free from some source of power. You don't need sails, you don't need coal, you don't need oil, you don't need gas, you don't need gasoline, you don't need anything, right? You got a ship that's gonna run for 20 years without doing anything to it. It was a pretty big deal. You know, and of course this was all very sinister now that you've got essentially a, uh, a doomsday weapon, you know? Uh, Collier's Magazine here showing the Nautilus is America's new dreadful weapon, you know? And uh, nuclear energy becomes a big deal. You know, we had a time where we were looking to make our whole Navy nuclear. And uh, so here is the first nuclear aircraft carrier, which was the USS Enterprise, right? Now decommissioned and taken apart. And then there is the first nuclear cruiser, the USS Long Beach, right? I saw this ship when it was being dismantled, okay? And then here you have another nuclear cruiser, the Bainbridge, right? And uh, it was decided, you know, but once you had started having nuclear accident, accidents, remember like Three Mile Island, et cetera? You know, people started becoming very, very freaky about nuclear energy, you see. Now, you couldn't deny that it had freed the ability to have this long leggedness of a ship because you don't have to fuel it with oil. Yet at the same time, immediately during the conservation era of the 1980s, et cetera, like, for instance, New York City. Now, I was one of the people who helped arrange Fleet Week every year. And you couldn't have a nuclear aircraft carrier or any other nuclear ship in New York Harbor, right? Because they didn't want it there. That was the rules of New York City. They didn't want something with a reactor being in the proximity to a large population, you see? So you always had to get an, a ship or an aircraft carrier or something as the main centerpiece of Fleet Week, but it couldn't be a nuke, you see? Now today, we don't have any aircraft carriers that are full-size aircraft carriers that aren't nuclear aircraft carriers. They're all nuclear aircraft carriers, okay? And then they actually decommissioned these cruisers and we don't have any cruisers that are nuclear. The only ships in the Navy now that are exclusively nuclear are our submarines and our full-size aircraft carriers. That's it. Everything else is conventionally powered. There's Admiral Rickover on the Nautilus. And there is the Nautilus underneath the, um, the Oakland Bay Bridge. It's a real game changer. So now they're gonna get ready to do something that changes the world on the Nautilus. They're going to run past the Bering Strait and they are going to submerge at the edge of the polar ice pack. 
and they are going to, for the first time in history, do something that Jules Verne's and everybody else for after Jules Verne's was dreaming about, which was to go underneath the polar ice cap and emerge on the other side of the earth. And so you'll notice something here. They have painted out the number 571 from the side of the sail of the Nautilus. And they just turned it into this big black boat, you see? Because after all, as you know, when you're going through the Bering Strait, you're going in between Russia and Alaska. And the Russians, I mean, they know what we're doing. And they, we didn't want to advertise to them that this was the Nautilus. We wanted the Russians to know, to think that we, we had 10 of these things. So we weren't gonna tell them that we was the Nautilus, let them guess. You see, that's where they painted out the whole number on it. See, 571. That's why this is all painted out. Do you ever see the movie um, Ice Station Zebra? It's like this Cold War sort of drama. It's got Ernest Borgnine and all of these other actors in it. And this is about an American submarine uh, that surfaces through the polar ice cap. You know, and it, by the way, the submarine in, in Ice Station Zebra was manufactured by the Electric Boat Company, okay? And, um, and it's this whole Cold War, Russia versus United States thing, because the polar ice cap was considered a, a very strategic area once you're in the missile age, because the Russians having full-size intercontinental ballistic missiles, right? they were going to launch the missiles from Siberia with nuclear warheads. And they were going to fly them straight north over the polar ice cap and then over Canada and to land in a backyard near you, you see? So the polar ice cap becomes this very strategic area during the, during the Cold War, you see? And the Russians have these big I don't know, radar stations up there, and we're looking to have these radar stations up there. And hence, that was the premise for the movie. And here is the actual track of the trip that the Nautilus took, right? There's the Bering Strait right over there in between Russia and the United States is Alaska. And they travel through here and they get right to the edge of the polar ice cap right over here. Can you see where my cursor is? Right, and what you're doing here is they have to go back and forth a few times because remember, nobody's ever done this before, and you're in a damn submarine, you know, so it's not like you can really see what's happening, you know, and it's uncharted, they never did it before, nobody's ever been under the polar ice cap before, okay, and they had to find a couple of ways to see how they could get under it, right, and they do, and then they go and they, they're deep enough now under all of this ice. And they go straight under the polar ice cap, right? And they are at the absolute top of the earth. First time in history, a ship has been there. And then they emerge out in between Greenland and Iceland, you see? This is a strategic game changer because the Russians don't have anything like this. And this chart, right, was a commemorative chart that would happen here once they're out the other end and they're obviously not dead, right? They, everyone in the crew signs the bottom of the chart. And this is now an actual sort of historical remembrance sort of a document. And that is what all these signatures are over here. Submerged polar transit, the Nautilus, 1958. Big bragging rights. An electric boat was considered it was considered to build the most reliable submarines in the world. Here is back before, you know, there was a nuclear ban on anything in New York Harbor, the Nautilus coming into New York Harbor. And you had a lot of fanfare and all the rest of it, because these guys were heroes by now, because they had already been under the North Pole, you know. There is a postage stamp uh, and it's commemorative stamp, right, of going back to when um, 
I forgot this guy's name, Pearson, I think it was, with the dog sleds, tried to go to across the North Pole. And then you have into 1909, 1959, right? 50 years commemoration. And then you have the Nautilus going underneath the North Pole in this stamp. The famous book over here by uh, William Anderson, who was the commander of the submarine back in those days. I have a copy of this, uh, Nautilus 90 North. And then submarines actually, they changed the shape of the hull because the Nautilus still had, was a hybrid, even though it was a, a nuclear submarine, it still had the same hull design that the Germans had designed at the end of World War II, the Type 21 U-boat design, you see? So what you really needed now is you needed a modern design of a submarine hull that would be just primarily hydrodynamic for underwater use, you see? And so if you were gonna you know, do something that was hydrodynamic for something that was gonna go underwater and stay underwater, what would it look like? Well, it would look like a, I don't know what, a dolphin, a fish, you know, something like that, right? You always use the example for nature. So the first submarine we designed like that, this was the USS Albacore, and this is called the Albacore style hull. So, and this is what modern submarines look like. You know, they have this, it's designed to be underwater all the time. And if you're on the surface, the hydrodynamics of the water going past the hull aren't gonna be efficient on the surface. But that's a secondary consideration because the primary thing for this submarine is to be underwater, see? There's the albacore. There's the hull of the Nautilus. This was, they copied this from the design of the Germans at the end of World War II. There's a stern shot, 1969, and the Nautilus is already 15 years old here, you know. These ships have a service life of about 25 years, right? Maybe 30 years if you push it. Okay, that's about it. Um, notice the propellers on these submarines, okay? Not just the Nautilus, but any ship. They are, this is actually top secret technology. You see, this is declassified now. But if you go to, like, I was an electric boat company when one of these uh, modern nuclear submarines was being serviced, right? Because I had a pass, you know, I had a pretty top level security clearance for naval installations, et cetera, back in the day. And even though the submarine would be completely exposed in a dry dock, the propellers would be completely covered, you see? from people taking photographs or for satellites looking down and taking a picture the propellers are special designs because remember the number one purpose of a submarine is stealth and the way that you find a submarine is by listening for it right that's the way you find things underwater you listen for it right sound travels through water and so the thing is with the propeller and what makes it so secret is that computer aided design is giving you the ability to design propellers that are quiet. There's something that happens when you push a propeller through, a war through water, okay? And this determines, this, this depends on how deep the submarine is because the deeper the submarine is, the more pressure there is on any given thing, right? When a propeller spins through the water, it kind of wants to make bubbles, you see? Now, if you're at a deep, if you're at a, 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 a deep submergence, the spinning propeller will create bubbles, but because of the pressure involved of a great depth, the bubbles will immediately collapse under the pressure of the water, you see? And that when they collapse, that makes noise. That is called cavitation. So if you're our enemy, and you're listening for us, if you've got propellers that make a lot of noise by creating bubbles that then collapse, you, you have bad propellers. So we were able to design propellers to actually minimize that cavitation problem. And I know you all wanted to know that, right? But you, and you'll be better people for having known that, okay? 
And the Nautilus is at the end of her life, her end of, end of her effective life. And then she gets turned into a museum ship, right? Which is like, you know, most of the kinds of ships. That, I mean, that's why I was on ships. I was turning them into museum ships, you see? And I was going through other ships that were going to be used as targets and things like that. And, um, and I was removing whatever was going to be necessary to use for uh, exhibits on other ships, right? And um, so that was my thing. And here is the Nautilus now moving through the Panama Canal, if you didn't recognize that, as a museum ship now. And she's headed back now, this is on the Thames River, and you're heading upriver, right? That would be New London to your left. And this is I-95 over you, right? And she's headed upriver to her final place, which is going to be this museum that's right next to Electric Boat, right? So you've got the Nautilus Museum, you've got the Groton Submarine Base, right? And then you've got the actual Electric Boat Company, one, two, three. And there she rests. And, you know, it's a position of prominence that the Nautilus has been retained right next to where she entered the world at the electric boat company, which is like a quarter mile up the river. It's cool stuff if you've never seen it, right? And here's a modern submarine coming past, coming up river past the Nautilus headed for the sub base. And this talks about modern submarines and how modern submarines are actually platforms that are uh, to launch ballistic missiles, right? You've got two kinds of submarines now. You've got attack submarines and you've got ballistic missile submarines, right? Now our, our attack submarines are designed to essentially be quiet and fast to be able to follow Russia or China or anybody else's ballistic missile submarines. So we follow them around. It's a game of cat and mouse under the water. And our adversaries, as well as us, have submarines all over the place that are capable of launching all of these nuclear warheads. And this is what part of the strategic triad of the Cold War, which was that, say for instance, the Russians were gonna launch a missile at us, right? and they succeed in blowing up some American city, right? Uh, we would, the Russians would know that we probably have five or 10 ballistic missile submarines within range of Russia. And then we would just launch a massive counter-strike against Russia from our submarines, where, which they can't take out because they don't know where they are, you see? So the point is mutually assured destruction in other words, what's the point? What's the point of dealing a decisive blow against the United States or vice versa if you just know that there's going to be a massive retaliatory strike from nuclear submarines? I mean, that's the point. That was detente. You see, it's kind of like I've got a gun and I'm pointing it at you and you've got a gun and you're pointing at me and you sort of reach this equal spot and you say, you know what, let's just both put the gun down with the understanding that should either one of us do something stupid, right, we still could literally kill each other, right? And, and that's the way we lived for all of these years and still do, by the way. You know, I just did a lecture yesterday, I'm going to do one tonight after this on, you know, the tensions between Taiwan and China and the United States foreign policy, you know, and so you've got, you've heard over the last two days that we have the USS Ronald Reagan, you know, which is going to be on a normal deployment. That's a nuclear aircraft carrier, you know, but what nobody ever talks about is there is a, a minimum of one nuclear submarine with that aircraft carrier and probably two, you see? Yeah, something that they never talk about because you don't talk about submarines. You never talk about submarines. So there you go. This is the Nautilus. Cool patch, right? Oh, and then, of course, you know, the lore of the Nautilus, right? You know, it traveled right into Star Trek. You see what I mean? And one of the, and one of the uh, Star Trek craft was called the USS Nautilus.
right? And the other, the other ships in like Captain Kirk's ship with the Enterprise, that was named after an aircraft carrier, famous American aircraft carrier, and the nuclear first nuclear aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, see? So, you know, these names, they carry a lot of, um, they carry a lot of tradition. So where am I? Let me go back to screen share. And now I'm gonna to go to the electric boat. And in this program, I'm gonna show you some specific slides about electric boat company. And um, quite a few of them are gonna be from the World War II era where the electric boat company was one of the largest recipients of United States military expenditure funds, okay? Because we built quite a few submarines at electric boat during World War II, right? And uh, this is one of my favorite shots here. You have this young lady who looks like she's about 15 years old, you see her? And she's got an acetylene torch. Uh, that's very cool, right? So you don't wanna, you wanna be nice. You, you always wanna be nice to somebody who's holding a, a settling torch, okay? Just a word to the wise. And it is just another, uh, another amazing thing where you had, it, it's, you know, the, this whole Rosie the Riveter phenomenon, it broke down so many stereotypes about what women could do, what African Americans could or couldn't do, and all the rest of this. It really drove our social evolution in a progressive fashion, to use a phrase or a couple of phrases. Um, this notion that, uh, you know, the 1940s was still a time where it's like, you know, this is what women should be doing, or this isn't what they should be doing and the ability of women to obviously be quite competent about any task they were assigned uh, became undeniable to anybody who wasn't a flat out, you know, misogynist. So that is all of the pictures you're gonna see now are, are, are at Electric Boat, including this one. <laughs> So uh, for those of you who don't know, you all know where Electric Boat is, I guess, right? So you've got Fisher Island Sound, Block Island Sound, right? It is just the eastern edge of um, Long Island Sound, right? And then here you've got the Thames River, right? You've got the United States Coast Guard Academy, right? Which I had to go to a lot for all kinds of trainings and all sorts of stuff. And um, back when I was serving with them, right? And up here is where this whole operations is about the new London submarine base, right? Also called the Groton sub base. And of course, um, electric boat is right there, right? And this is, of course, I-95. I'm going to show you a couple of things you might not have noticed, noticed about I-95 also. Right, so even the town of, uh, of Groton, you know, it has, it has, of course, what you might expect from a coastal New England town, you know, a picture of some kind of a, uh, something you would see on an island or at the edge of the water. But also, look what's at the bottom. You see it? It's a submarine. See, so actually the town of Groton, Connecticut is completely associated and indistinguishable with its identity of being like the submarine capital of the world, you see, um, incorporated 1705. Right, here's a, an old postcard I found, United States submarine base at Groton, right? And, you know, you have all of these different submarine piers you know, at any given time during the submarine fleet being at sea, you've got a portion of this of the fleet that's being serviced or upgraded, okay? And, um, and then you've got a portion that's at sea. The way they do it nowadays is that the submarines are literally so reliable um, and so overbuilt that they have two crews for every submarine, right? Especially the... Uh, the boomers, the one that are the missile submarines, 
This is an older picture before the boomers were around. They have a gold crew and a blue crew, right? So if you're on the blue crew, you, your submarine is out at sea with the gold crew and you're on leave, right? Then the gold crew comes back and then the boat, they reprovision the boat. And then you get on as the blue crew and you take the boat right back out. And you're out there for another, you know, whatever it is, six months. So if you've ever been, you know, off the highway over here, you know, you, this is a sign. And of course it's set up as the Nautilus and it's this, the Groton, the submarine capital of the world. You know, so this is kind of bragging rights for Connecticut and for Groton, Connecticut, you know, if you find this interesting. Right, here's the entrance to the sub base, Naval Submarine Base, New London, Connecticut, right? Uh, and it's Groton. You know, and this is the original, these are the original dolphins, right, that they have on the, you have um, insignia over your ribbons, right, that tells the onlooker what part of the Navy you're in, like what group, you're, are you serving in the submarine service, are you a surface warfare officer, you know, and all the rest of that stuff, you know, whatever you've qualified in, then you get to wear what's referred to as a device, okay. And if you're an enlisted person, then it's going to be silver. And if you're a, an, an officer, it will be gold, right? And that goes for wings, right? Uh, if you're a pilot, that goes for the submarine dolphins. And that goes for the surface warfare device also, if you're on the surface fleet. And here's what one of those early subs looks like, right? And this is what the early submarines that were being built on the Holland design, uh, they're all riveted together. And uh, I'll remind you that Connecticut was really an ideal place for the industrial revolution. Uh, the, as we've talked about in other lectures, you know, the entire Connecticut River Valley, right? Which roughly would include what we're talking about here is was ideal because you had access to the Atlantic Ocean, you had access to um, raw materials, you had access to a skilled labor force, you had access to a highly educated and, li and literate workforce, you see? And these were ideal things in the Industrial Revolution. There you go. So here's some submarines in the early days. You know, you had to volunteer for this. You still have to volunteer for it, right? Um, uh, this, is, this was pretty grisly work back in the day. You know, the early boats, they were called, a lot of people called them pig boats, right? And that became kind of like a derisive moniker for a long time. You know, because the people who worked in submarines were constantly smelly, they were constantly filthy, they, they were just you know, dripping with perspiration like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they smelled like smoke, you know, uh, they had respiratory problems, all of the above, and, and when you were next to a submarine tender, right, you have these ships that are just for submarines, the submarines would dock around it, and nestle around it while the people on the submarine tender would work on their little flock of submarines. You see, I, I'm wearing my shirt today, which is the USS Fulton, which is a ship that I worked on, right? Very large vessel and it was a submarine tender, right? And, um, and when all of these little submarines back in the day when they were list little were nestled around the mother ship, they look like suckling pigs around a mother pig. That's why they call them pig boats. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how did I live this long and not know that? Right? Stick with me. So this is uh, an advertisement, right, of, of the Holland Torpedo Boat Company. Now, that was the one, as I told you, that got, they started off in Jersey. Right. And now you have the electric boat company was put into business 
just for the purpose of building the Holland designed boats, right? So now you have proper the electric boat company, right? And that is at the current location in Groton, Connecticut, right? Now that got re, um, they reorganized the company and now it's General Dynamics, right? It's a General Dynamics company. And they split off some of the sub manufacturers that were part of the original electric boat. Now the electric boat company that actually builds the submarines is still called electric boat as a matter of tradition, but it's all General Dynamics, you see. Submarine, look at this, they're building submarines for everybody, for the US, for Great Britain, Russia, Holland, Denmark, Finland, Chile, Japan, Austria, Spain, Norway, Canada, Italy, right? Not everybody could build a submarine. Electric Boat Company became a famous company in all of this. Now, just to show you something else, this is not an electric boat. You know where this is, the submarine over here? There was a competing manufacturer building submarines in Bridgeport. Did you know that? Here is a submarine going into the Long Island Sound at Bridgeport, right? And this was another character named Simon Lake, who was like literally a competitor of the electric boat company, you see? And they were building, so, so the United States Navy, they would, they would throw a couple of contracts to Simon Lake, they would throw a couple of contracts to the electric boat company, and, the, so in other words, the coast of Connecticut was like the, it, you know, it was like, it, it was like um, chocolate from Switzerland, okay? If we were like the submarine capital of the world, right here in Connecticut on the coast, you see? And that is being launched at the end of Seaview Avenue, wherever that is, in, in Bridgeport, right into, the long, right into Long Island Sound. And it was a boat made by Simon Lake, which then it got, of course, got absorbed by the other companies, you see. But I just wanted to show you that. This was a really ideal area for industry. Uh, this is a typical builder's plate. Right, USS Pickerel. American submarines were always named after fish, right? Not anymore. Okay, but you know, when they were the, the, the capital ships were named after states and after people and things like that. Back in these days, when battleships were named after states, you know, this, all of the submarines, even though they had a hull number like SS one, two, three, four, whatever it was, they all were named after fish, right? So the USS Pickerel, and this is called a builder's plate. And this was a highly sought after thing for guys like me who were always, I mean, it was my job to comb a ship from one end to the other for every single curatorial item that was on that ship. Because in a week's time, that ship was going to be the bottom of the, of the ocean. Okay. And this was like last chance to get anything you need from this ship that you could use on other vessels or for museum. Okay. And a builder's plate like this was gold, right? Built at Groton, Connecticut, authorized March 27, 1934. That's when Congress appropriated the funds for it. Keel laid March 25, 35, launched July 7, 1936, right? Now, before World War II, you can see that it took, you know, this entire process took like literally two years, right? During World War II, they were banging these things out three or four at a time. I mean, it was just amazing how fast they could build a submarine. And inch for inch, a submarine is the most complicated warship that exists. First commissioned in 1937. These are the ships that became the frontline vessels in World War II. Um, here's another submarine late in the war, right? March 30th, 1944, being launched into the Thames River, right? And this is being launched on the ways in a traditional fashion, stern first into the river. And that's what a submarine looks like when it's being launched. It's a big deal. And here's the workforce in Connecticut. 
right, in Groton. And, you know, that's what it looked like. You have three shifts round the clock headed all from, you know, the, the local areas. And, you know, he, even uh, where we are a little further down the coast here, I mean, it was all kinds of, you know what we manufactured a lot down in, in Fairfield County, we manufactured, there were a lot of hat factories, a lot of military hats, all kinds of smaller contracts going out I mean, part of what our program is today is Connecticut industry. We'll be talking about Norden bomb sites soon, et cetera, aircraft engines, right? We had a very highly skilled workforce here in Connecticut, and that's what it looked like going to work in like 1943. Here's a war poster, a production poster. I don't know if you've ever worked in a factory before. I've worked in factories, right? And they, you know, you would have these, I don't know, kind of like production morale posters. And here you have the phenomenon of Rosie the Riveter, right? And women in war industry, we salute you, see? And you see the submarine, that's an electric boat submarine on the bottom there, see it? So it's a specific morale poster and thank you poster and don't come to work to late, a uh, work late poster right, for electric boat. You got a woman there and you can immediately tell what job she has by what she's wearing. She's a welder, right? Cause she's wearing welding goggles, but even more so than that, her hair is covered. And also if you're a welder, I don't know how many of you have actually ever welded something. You have this, you have to make sure that you've got something in your neck, okay? Because while you're welding, especially arc welding, there are going to be pieces of tiny molten metal that are going to be showering in the air. And no matter how tightly you button yourself up, those pieces of molten metal are going to find their way into two places, down your neck and into your shirt. And they really hurt. Okay. So you can tell that she's a welder, right? The Victory Display Committee, National Retail Associations, blah, blah. Uh, OWI is Office of War Information. You know, the whole Rosie the River thing, by the way. I mean, it's like, frankly, after the war, there was a lot of women. It's like, you know what? I'm pretty good at this welding. I think I'm going to stay there. But as much as this became your patriotic duty to fill in for where the guys weren't because they were all in the service, now it was your patriotic duty to do what? To get the hell out of here so the guys can have their jobs back. See, so that's what happened to a lot of the women. They were like, yeah, I want to be a welder. I'm a good welder. No, 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 that's a man's job. Oh yeah, it wasn't a man's job six months ago. So here is a great picture. I love this picture. This is at Electric Boat and they're standing next to the old punch clock. Remember the, the punch clock? You, th you take the card and you punch it in there. And here's three local girls from Connecticut. Right. And I just love the way that they're 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 dressed for the job. But these two ladies on the outside, at least, they, they've a little bit feminized their outfits. You see, so here's like a pair of coveralls, but they're feminized. You see, it's got the little sweetheart top is shaped like a heart. And you see that. Right. And this girl over here, she's got this little she's accessorized her coveralls a little bit with the skinny leather belt. Right. And uh, this uh, young lady in the middle, I think she's found the job for her from the looks of it. Three local Connecticut girls. And here's a great picture of them building subs right at electric boat. So you're, they're building them there. And it's there's something I, I like things that show the dignity of just people working, you know. It's like, you don't need to be a genius. You don't have to be getting a PhD in astrophysics. I mean, it, it, there's something good about just showing people just who are competently working in a skilled trade that are just there. It's them, it's the machine, and that's it. It's assembled properly, it's tightened properly. This is the business end of a prow of a submarine, by the way. You can see the six torpedo tubes in the front, 
This class of submarine carried 24 torpedoes, right? More than any other nation that built submarines. Now the old submarines that were diesel electric, like all of them were before you had uh, nuclear submarines, they had to spend most of their time on the surface, right? Because you got to run the diesel engines to create propulsion and also to create electricity to recharge the batteries. And they only temporarily went under the water and then they resurfaced again, you see? So the hull was designed, or better yet, the superstructure was designed so it looked like a boat because most of the time you were on the surface, you see? <clears throat> That's why modern submarines, which don't have to be on the surface, except if you're coming into port, they are designed with a 100% hydrodynamic hull that's designed to be submerged all the time, you see? And that's the difference between the older boats and the newer boats from that regard. By the way, you see this, this the way that the, the, the metal is rolled here? You know, I don't know if you've ever been in a machine shop where metal was being rolled, I have. And it's, it's quite the process. You see, they have this, they have three rollers, one in the middle that's on one side, and you have two outer rollers that are on the bottom side. And you actually pass the, imagine like three rolling pins, okay? And, the mat, and you pass the piece of steel back and forth, and you constantly increase the pressure between the center roller that's on one side in between the two rollers that are on the other side. And then you pass it through some more. You see, and it just slowly shapes the metal. And what he's using there, he has a wooden gauge to show you when you've achieved the right radius. And it's just as simple as that. Here's another shot of one of the shifts at Electric Boat Company during the war, when you have these young ladies coming off shift and then you had, I mean, there were hundreds of people on these boats when they were being manufactured 24 hours a day until they were finished. Um, you had electricians, welders, riveters, carpenters, people who were experts in linoleum, painters, steam fitters, electricians, if I didn't already mention that. I mean, every possible trade you can imagine, okay? That's what electric boat looks like from the air now. Here's the main shed, this sort of like this, this uh, grayish blue building. And they'll build the submarine inside here. And then they'll, they'll actually dolly it out onto here, you see? And um, that's where the ships are built now. And these other yards are for servicing. These are dry docks. What you have here is the ability to submerge this whole thing you float the subs in and then you actually pump the water out of the saddle tanks they're called. And now they're above and out of the water where you can work on the hull. Here's a great Rosie the Riveter shot from World War II. The amount of, the amount of mechanics and valves and welding and fittings, it, it, was, it was incredible. Absolutely incredible on one of these craft. Good picture. Uh, here's two submarines almost lost in this in this forest of of kind of like wooden scaffolding here being built. They were knocking these things out one after the other. This is March seventh, nineteen forty three. Electric Boat Company. Uh, every time a boat is launched, it has a, a commissioning ceremony or a launching ceremony, submarine salmon. Here's a nice shot of, uh, this is uh, from New London, looking over the river, looking east over the Thames River towards, uh, towards the sub base, et cetera. And that ship is the USS Eagle right, which is the Coast Guard's famous training vessel, right, one of the more famous sailing ships that still exist in the world, right, and all of the Coast Guard Academy people as a 
midshipmen, you have to go there and you have to learn how to handle the rigging of an old fashioned sailing ship because that's supposed to build a sort of a character and confidence in you that you're not gonna get behind a computer screen. And I would tend to agree with that. Um, I don't know if you know the history of the Eagle. The Eagle is actually a Nazi ship, okay? We inherited it after World War II from the Germans and the German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, the war Navy used it as a training vessel for their crews, you see? And we took it and we painted it white, we refitted it. And now it's the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle. In Germany, it was called the Horst Vessel, which was a, a person that's named after some person. Here's a, like a WPA art kind of a scenario here, you see? So you have, um, another electric boat company submarine being built on the ways, right? And um, that's 1943, the USS Chubb, right? Uh, the declivity is means that how many, what the slope is per, per foot, right? As far as when she's gonna slide into the water. And that's the Thames River behind them. Another colorized postcard the old sub base, uh, the Groton submarine base. This is a, uh, this is an iconic figure. This is called the dive tower. You see, so what you would have to do to qualify for submarines is you would have to be able to, with something called a Momsen lung, okay, to be able to actually ascend from the bottom of this all the way to the top of the tower, you see, uh, which is filled with water, you see. And it's not for every, you have to have the psychological wherewithal to be able to not freak out when you're doing this, by the way. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this. You know, I was trained as a diver and, you know, and I, I basically came to a couple of panicky situations myself. It is unnatural being underwater and not being able to breathe, right? Your body doesn't want, it doesn't like that. And, you know, it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of control. I successfully got my dive ticket, but, but I had to get my, I had to get my, I had to get my head right, literally. And so anyway, so the point is that if you're stuck in a submarine, right, and the submarine is movable, yet you're within some distance to the water where you could actually survive, say two, 300 feet, can you come through the emergency hatch in the submarine and ascend to the surface? And that is what this dive tank is designed to simulate, see? The Spearfish Launching Souvenir. This is from the 30s. I just love the artwork, right? I, I used to see a lot of stuff like this in back, you know, in my former career. You know, you always had a lot of artists around and this is typically done by somebody who was part of the crew. It's pretty handy work. You know, they weren't exactly sitting behind computers doing this, you know, with some kind of a, you know, uh, computer program, you know, I mean, you had people who were actually drawing this. Here's a great picture of these two young ladies who are painting the inside of one of those escape hatches that I was telling you about, you know, inside the sub, you tried to keep it bright, you tried to keep it, they, they had this crazy green color, right, which was this like, sort of like light green, like with a hint of yellow in it. And, and they, Everything was painted that because they wanted to make it seem as though that your brain thought you were someplace green. Because obviously you weren't someplace green, right? You were you were like in a metal tube. So and here are these it's a great shot. I love this cult this these color photographs from this era. Uh, here's electric boat company. Right, and you also had something called, which is an associate company to the electric boat company called the Electric Launch Company, right, or Elco. And they built all kinds of boats, PT boats, like the kind that John F. Kennedy was on, the patrol torpedo boats, those were typically built by Elco, right? And that was something else that got split off when it became General Dynamics, okay? Here's another great picture from, um, 
from the Rose of the Riveter days during World War II. There's New London in the background across the river. Great stuff. Right, now this is what modern electric, sub, uh, modern electric boat submarines look like, right? And so, you know, this, these are uh, modern um, subs uh, that are, you know, completely nuclear, of course. And these are the, this is what the submarines that we're using today look like. And these things are all over the place. And not only is the United States have a whole fleet of these things, but so do the Russians, so do the Chinese, right? So do the Indians, so do the British, and God knows who else, right? You could probably, if all of these submarines surfaced at the same time, I'd probably be able to walk from here to, I don't know, Ireland, right? On the tops of the submarines without getting my feet wet, okay? Yes, that's a dramatic overstatement, but you see my point. These oceans are filled with submarines. Here's another one that's being launched right into the Thames, right? This is a boomer, right? You can tell the difference between the shape of the hull. This one is designed to carry, these things carry like 16 missiles in vertical silos. And every one of those missiles has 10 nuclear warheads. Listen to this. Every one of those missiles has 10 nuclear warheads. They're called MIRVs, M-I-R-V, multiple independent re-entry vehicle. I can't even believe I remembered that. Okay, so in other words, for every missile that you fire, it'll break off into 10 warheads to 10 targets. It's unbelievable, okay? And they could be, you could launch Tomahawk missiles, you could launch all kinds of things. The firepower on one of these submarines is more than all of the explosive force used in every other war combined. It's amazing. Right, there's what one looks like in a dry dock at electric boat. It's an incredible weapon, an absolutely incredible weapon. And nobody ever talks about submarines, right? So on TV, when Nancy Pelosi goes to Taiwan, well, we're sending the United States ship Ronald Reagan with its air group to the Taiwan Strait on a normal deployment, right? You never talk about submarines. It is secret. Here is a nuke coming down river, right? So there's the I-95 bridge, right? And you've got this sub coming out. And maybe you might have even seen one of these. If you're a boater from Eastern Long Island or, you know, Block Island Sound or something like that, it wouldn't be unusual to actually see one of these things coming out. Now, I want to show you something. You see the size of this bridge? I think this thing's called the Gold Star Memorial Bridge, if I'm not mistaken, right? These bridges, next time you drive out to Rhode Island Way or something like that, take a look when you're driving on 995, right? You got the, you got the bridges that go over all of the rivers for whatever they are, and they, they're not massive bridges. They're, you know, as big as they need to be. But when you get to the Thames River, you have this massive, high, overbuilt structure. As a matter of fact, not only are there one bridges of about eight lanes apiece, there's two bridges of eight lanes apiece, you see? And the reason for that is that they have to be redundant. You need redundancy because as this is a military target, it is a hard target. God forbid there's a nuclear war, one of them is gonna land right here, you see? Because this is the only one out of two places in the entire country that can build and maintain our nuclear submarine fleet. So this is going on the first day. That's why you have to have these massive bridges here where you can have um, the ability to not only transport materials to secondary locations, but have two bridges if one of them is knocked out. This is an entire defense structure. As a matter of fact, the entire interstate highway system in the United States was designed as a Cold War project 
so that we could get, if we were attacked with nuclear missiles, to be able to get people out of cities and get help and medical supplies into cities. That's why you have the interstate highway system. It wasn't designed so people like my dad can get into Chevrolet and take his kids on vacation. Okay, that was a secondary thing. This was a defense project. The interstate highway system in the United States was designed to be able to get people and military supplies from one place to the other during the inevitable nuclear exchange that was going to happen that we were expecting by 1960. Um, here is just um, another view of electric boat from the air. Right there's the Gold Star Memorial Bridge looking down river. See it? This is not like any other bridge across any of the rivers in Connecticut. This one is massive. And there's two of them for the reasons I just told you. It is a military installation. Here's another sub coming in in the uh, fog. You saw this one in my previous program. There's the Nautilus coming home up the Thames River. Here's another ship. Remember that building I was telling you about? So electric boat builds the subs in the shed, and then they roll them out. And here's one rolling out. It's awesome. Here's a commissioning. The USS Virginia. Now, during World War II, only the major warships, like battleships, were named after states. You see, but now these ships are the major warships. Right? So our aircraft carriers are named after famous people. The submarines are now named after states. And if you're lucky enough, maybe if you happen to be there, maybe you'll catch a glimpse of the sub coming in or out. And I hope that you do. It's kind of cool. I, this is a little reminiscent to me because I loved being on ships so much. And it was a real opportunity. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Is there any questions in the chat room? We have anything? So electric boat uh, is awesome. Uh, try to go to the sub museum or where the Nautilus is if you can. It is essentially, it'll, it'll give you a slideshow or a, some kind of a depiction of submarine history uh, as I tried to do in our program today. Um, but instead of just talking about it as a country, as a, as a company, I wanted to show you a few things about submarines. So I hopefully you'll get an appreciation of how complicated these things are and the history of them. And thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, too, very much, Art. And this would not have been possible without the support of the friends of the library here at Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.